Welcome to Entrepreneur News. I'm Lauren Riley. Today, I had the pleasure of being here with Murray Gillen. I first met Murray in uh, 2004 when I started a Masters of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Australian Graduate School of Entrepreneurship. And I was sitting there in O Week, first day in an auditorium full of people. The next thing, Murray comes up bounding with energy, explaining what entrepreneurship is and who entrepreneurs are. So today what I want to do is to capture some of Murray's knowledge and his wisdom on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and innovation, on his particular area of research, which is energy and intuition, which just fascinates everyone, as well as the education that comes with it. So welcome and thank you so much for your well, time. Thank you, Lauren. It's great to be back with you again. Always. <laughs> so how did you start off? Because you started off in engineering and you were the dean of the School of Engineering. How did you go from move from there into entrepreneurship and create that within an institution? Well, it didn't happen at Swinburne. I had already made the transition in thinking mm -hmm. uh, earlier because uh, I was actually in, in uh, defence research uh, ah. before that, and I was then in the middle in the seventies, middle seventies, uh, the defence attaché in um, Washington at the Australian Embassy, mm -hmm. and on the research and development side. And so I actually started looking at companies who were taking new knowledge and applying it to new equipment and new products and new services. Oh, defence would be at the core of now, that. They were indeed, or at least the companies were. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was to see the way in which they took that knowledge and then changed its added value to the point that they could actually not only sell it to defence but actually commercialise it with new products and services. You know, Hewlett Packard was a classic with the way they went with instruments and then finally to computers. So that's what I actually observed, the way they did that. Mm -hmm. It was actually applying innovation and then utilising that innovation to grow a new business or a new product or service. So when I came back to Australia, I was still in the research laboratories, although I was head of lab programs by then, and I tried to introduce this thinking, but oh. I was way ahead of my time and the lab people weren't interested in commercialisation, they were just interested in doing research. So it never happened. Isn't research about furthering new knowledge? Ah, Isn't there yes, a conflict? but there is satisfaction and indeed uh, comfort in just looking at knowledge for knowledge's sake. Okay, got it. Rather than trying to go outside your boundary, because most of these people don't have any real commercial um, experience. Yeah. So that's why it happens. However, I then went to Swinburne in 1979, and uh, the government of the day, um, or the department, Department of uh, uh, Pro uh, Productivity, I think it was, uh, they started up a new program uh, in training or actually giving people in engineering and chemistry and science, uh, students that is, in their final year, mm -hmm. an understanding of how you wrote a business plan. The idea being, well, we've got to give these people some understanding, so we'll give them a business plan. Mm -hmm. Fatal flaw, but never mind, <laughs> we'll come back to that. So then, uh, and engineering, of which I was dean, as you rightly said, uh, we sent our students, and after two years, so in 19, 1979, 1980, 19, in 1980, the government said, this really isn't for us to do, we shouldn't be having to manage this, a university ought to do it. Oh. So they called for nominations, and I put my hand up. Love it. And in and so in 1981, I became the director of the what was then the Victorian Enterprise Workshop before it became a national workshop. Mm -hmm. And we then had a committee and a, a, a practitioners from outside, and we actually called for people to to come and do the program, which went over around about four months. 
on and off in, in, in block periods. And then we had a big competition at the end. So that was the infancy of the pracademic style of teaching. Well, that was, I started that concept because we needed to have both the knowledge side and the experiential side, the practice side. And as you well know, having done the MEI, we make no apology for having 50% nominal, 50% knowledge, theory, and 50% practice, because otherwise it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we started running these things, and uh, they were well received. Uh, it was a bit like the inventors program. People would come with an invention, mm -hmm. and then try to write a business plan. Now, as you can probably guess, most people who came with an invention were going to be problems uh, because they were so convinced their invention was so great. Oh, so product focused. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I can so it became it. difficult. Yes. And by 1984, 19, yes, 84 would have been, I'd actually, and we were using, um, no, we weren't using Timmons's book at that stage, but uh, I recognised that we had a problem. We were teaching people, or trying to teach people, how to write a business plan in order to get money, mm -hmm. but teaching them nothing about no, how to manage, thing. well, nothing about how to manage, grow, handle all the things that you're going to nest do in order to make yourself sustainable and make money. Mm -hmm. So that, to my mind, was a fatal flaw. In fact, it was a fatal flaw. Mm -hmm. And so we took the opportunity then, or I took the opportunity and said, why don't we turn this, why don't we also leave that running, why don't we start a graduate diploma? I didn't go to the masters at that stage, that would have been pushing it. <laughs> so in 1985 we wrote it all up, yes. and the first class started in 1986. Uh, it was called a graduate diploma of entrepreneurial studies, very generic. <laughs> And we had that then as a, uh, a joint program between the business faculty and the engineering faculty, which they said was fantastic. You say this is the first time we've ever had this cooperative activity. Yeah. And so the four subjects were taken by engineering faculty, four were taken by business faculty, and you could imagine the business faculty took finance, marketing, um, whatever else, organisation, I think. Uh, and engineers we took the others which were more product oriented mm -hmm. but it didn't work oh. because what had happened was academics particularly are very much locked into their silo of knowledge mm -hmm. and as you're well aware the program we wanted wasn't expertise in silos it was how do you apply silo knowledge in the horizontal in the lateral sense and so the staff over in the business faculty, instead of taking notes of taking note of what we wanted, they just started teaching finance 101, oh. marketing 101, organisation 101, and we couldn't get them to change. And the students, this is how I picked it up initially, the students were saying to me, you said but we're going to integrate this knowledge. We're not. We're just getting blocks of knowledge. So no assignments, real world. Oh well, they no had assignments, but no, it, the assignments were still within the silo without thinking of it in a lateral sense. Yeah. And so it's the it's the issue of integration in entrepreneurship. You must integrate your understanding and where you get your network and contacts from to bring it into what you're on about. You allow experts to do the silo work for you, but as an entrepreneur, you've got to be the integrator. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I got so, I, I couldn't solve the problem. They didn't want to change. So after having been to the United States in um, uh, 1988, it was mm -hmm. yeah, the middle of '88 at one of these Babson conferences. In fact, it was Jeffrey Timmons that I went to see from the Timmons book. Oh, so that's where that started. Well, it didn't I mean that book was already in in, uh, in, in production? Your relationship. But I went with to him. see him, mm -hmm. and we had a great time, and uh, went to the conference. But I also stayed on in Babson for a few weeks while we integrated and found a lot of the teaching material. Uh huh. And so when I came back to Australia, uh, I said to my wife, I said one weekend, I said now. I don't want you to interrupt me, I'm just going to work on this, I've got to get it done. 
And so in over the weekend, I actually developed the first Master of Entrepreneurship and Innovation program, which had 12 subjects in it, all nicely integrated, and not all the content, of course, but all the structure. Mm -hmm. And I went back and put that into the university to have it accredited. And within six weeks from that weekend, I had it accredited as a master's degree in the university. Wow. Now, that's a record. That's never been done. It won't be done before again because <laughs> we did it by virtue of the business faculty making the comment, and I got this from the dean later, not at that time, because to get accreditation, you have to go to your academic board and it has to be voted on and supported by the university. Yes. I always expected to get a lot of hassle from the business faculty. So anyway, when we got to the uh, board meeting, it just went through like that. I couldn't believe it. And a few years later, the dean said to me, he said, you don't know what happened, do you? I said, no, I don't. He said, we caucused beforehand. Oh. <laughs> and he said, we decided... The engineers know nothing about management. They don't know how to do this sort of stuff. Why don't we let them have it? Then it'll fall over, they'll have egg on their face, and we'll look good because we can then go ahead and do what we want to do. Well, of course, the irony of all that was that the graduate school of the business world was known as the Graduate School of Entrepreneurship with the MEI, the flagship. They now, that was a few years later. <laughs> but that program and the program you did is very similar to what was set up in 1989. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's an interesting story, but it's also been a battleground. Yes. Because universities are not really structured or indeed from an academic point of view, they, they tend to think in in-depth degree of a silo and knowledge or discipline rather than the broad issue. And mm -hmm. I mean, I brought this in in engineering because of that very real problem within the engineering discipline or engineering curriculum. Mm -hmm. and, and so the university doesn't like it because it, it tends to, to take resources away from what they want to do their thing, their discipline. Which is fair enough. Shouldn't uh, their end goal be the development of the <laughs> students and well, of their course, life and of career? Of course. But, you know, a lot of rhetoric goes on these days. You've only got to look at the politicians, how much rhetoric comes out and how much action comes that actually occurs. Very cool. So that's the problem you have. And the battleground I had for all my time at Swinburne, both after I retired and in the interim, in the last few years or more, last decade, I suppose, uh, has been a battle to maintain the support for entrepreneurship education. Not that it takes over everything, but that it's got a place. Yes. Now